maybe I could tell you a story. Maybe I can tell you two stories. Maybe if you push me, I'll tell you three or four. I don't know if I've ever shared with you the story of a carpenter. Let's call the carpenter, I don't know, Jack. This particular man who's been in the business of building houses for decades, one day wakes up and uh, Kind of just feels tired. His body is tired, his mind is tired, his emotions are tired. And like the rest of us in this class, desires to find a shade somewhere so his body can rest and relax, his mind can rest and relax, and his emotions can rest and relax. So he calls his boss, who he's been working with for many, many, many decades, and tells him, I just don't want to do this anymore. I'm far too tired. Give me what you owe me, and so I can retire to the mountains and think about the meaning of life. And his boss, who likes him very much, says, fine. And he hangs up the phone. The phone rings, the carpenter picks up the phone, and his boss says to him, I know you don't have very much money, you don't have very much savings. Why don't I make a deal with you? You build me one last house, and I'll pay you triple. And then you can retire to the mountains. You don't have to go to the mountains empty-handed. You can have a good amount of money in your pocket. The carpenter says, let me think about this a little. And despite his body, his mind, his emotions telling him, just rest, walk away from the whole thing. Desires are something very, very different. You know, there are four of us in this classroom who are about 60 and perhaps older. And though our minds may be young and we may imagine that you're able to run and sprint and do A, B, C, D, the moment you get up to walk, you realize, yeah, your imagination is young, but physically you just <laughs> you can no longer do this alone. And so what the carpenter does is he rejects the facts and the truths and the intuitive messages given to him by his mind, emotions, and body that retire. You can't do this for money anymore. It's impossible. But like many of us in this class who sometimes know and feel the truth but turn the other direction, the carpenter says, yes, I'll build you one last house. And so after a few weeks into the job, he comes to realize that he just can't do it. So he goes to Home Depot, to A's, to Lowe's, and buys the cheapest, the most crummiest materials. And they get delivered to the place, and he builds his house in no time. Six months, seven house, a two, three-story building. And he calls his boss and says, the house is finished. Come, take a look, inspect. If it's your satisfaction, give me my money so I can retire to the mountains. I hate living in society. I hate being around people. And so his boss comes, they're both standing outside, and the carpenter is puzzled because, you know, this man is, even though he has the keys, he's not opening, unlocking the door to go inside. Instead, he takes the keys and gives it to the carpenter and says, this is my gift to you. After many years of your dedication, I just want to give you this house free of charge. And initially, the carpenter is really, really excited and happy. But soon he comes to realize that this house has been made in such a clumsy way that it'll fall apart in no time. 
during the rain, no doubt it'll start to leak and then it'll begin to rot. And so though initially happy, later on it comes to realize this is nothing to be happy about. I guess in some ways all of us in this class are a carpenter to our own lives. You know, we walk into relationships assuming that we have the proper tools to build a nice house that will eventually become a nice home. We assume ourselves to be great parents perhaps, that we can raise this kid or a set of kids to be relatively happy emotionally, intellectually, physically. And even though we are somewhat incompetent, we lack the sufficient tools, even if you were to have the tools, you probably don't have the knowledge as to how these tools should be used. And so what we do is we invest a lot of time, lots of energy, lots of fantasies in creating whatever house it is that you want to build. And after a few years or months or days or hours, you come to realize this house is just no good. It's no different than the relationships, romantic or otherwise, that you and I get ourselves involved with. That initially we are fueled and powered by imagination, fantasies, hopes, dreams. And the little by little, there are, you'll find wrinkles in the relationship. You begin to argue, then the argue turns into a, begin with a discussion, then it turns into argument, then it turns into a fight. Then after a few weeks, you say, I think I want to go out of this particular relationship. I think a good amount of life, Julian, begins with a good amount of assumptions. You assume that you know what it means to be a Christian. You assume you know what it means to be a father or a mother. Uh, I mean, we're just kind of plagued by assumptions. Then something really awful happens. Um, you know, life pushes you into situations that you kind of try to figure things out, but you can't. Uh, you assume very much like if you've seen the movie um, Titanic, when they are at the very front of the ship, he says, I am the king of this world or king of the world or something like that. Uh, and at the beginning of every relationship, your assumptions push you into assuming that you know exactly what you're doing, you know exactly where you're going. And then little by little, time reveals to you how incompetent you really, really are. And then you're forced to kind of figure out how you can get yourself out of this particular situation that is somewhat unpleasant. Now, the only reason why you begin to reflect about anything in life, I mean, thinking is about problem solving. And we think because life is complicated because there are no ready-made answers. You know, it's like going to Target and buying a jigsaw puzzle, and you have to sit back and figure out, you know, how you can put this thousand-piece puzzle together. It requires thinking. And every branch of life is very much like that. It's a puzzle. Now, the assumption initially is we are engaged, active organisms that you have no choice but to be active whether physically or emotionally or psychologically or intellectually, it matters very little. Life, the moment you wake up, you have to figure out, what the hell am I going to do today? How am I going to entertain myself? How am I going to keep myself from getting bored, from becoming frustrated? You know, imagine like right now you're sitting in this class and you say, well, this guy is monotone. He's uninteresting. He's unexciting, uninspiring. That's not an easy place to be for it really matters very little how old you may be. I mean, you have to stay here till about 1045. I mean, 1045 of listening to someone who is monotone, listening to ideas that are uninteresting and you're bored. I mean, that's a painful place to be in. And so what do you do? Some of it is automatic. Imagination all of a sudden kick in. You begin to fantasize about the Super Bowl, about your boyfriend, girlfriend, cat, dog, your roommate perhaps who doesn't really have a sad pronoun but has, you know. So 
And then before you know it, you know, you've been in this world of imagination for about five, ten minutes, you catch yourself. Oh, well, let me go back and see what the hell this guy is talking about. You listen for another two, three minutes, you realize nothing that I say captures your attention. And again, automatically you go back into the world of imagination. And that's how the day goes, you know. Now, reflection is something different. Uh, thinking is basically a reaction to your outer environment. I look at you, I say something to you, then you have to figure out how you want to respond to me, how you want to react to me. So thinking is a reaction to whatever the environment is forcing you to be. Reflection is something very, very different. Reflection is... Imagine you go home and you listen to, say, one of the lectures you have to listen to for the next three weeks. And you begin to think about it, you know, you say, okay, well, how am I going to put this in this essay? How am I going to write this out? And then as you're washing dishes, for example, all of a sudden, my voice comes into your head. And let's say it's about despair, or let's say it's about joy, or let's say it's about how healthy confusion could be. And then as you're washing dishes, you take a concept and you take it inside you. And the moment you begin to take a concept inside you, you begin to reflect. The thing about reflection is that it contains a good amount of emotions. It allows you to be very much in the present, to kind of figure out how does this concept apply to me? What am I to do with despair? What am I to do with confusion? And it's a painful process because you don't really like to take things on the inside to figure things out. And I'll tell you a story as to why we don't like to reflect. We like to think because thinking is very much like problem solving. It's about you and your relationship with something out there. You can see it. You can touch it. You know who the villain is. You know who the culprit is. Okay. There is a man, and some of you may know the story. It comes from uh, the Sufi tradition. It's part of the mystical Islamic tradition. Uh, it's like the Franciscans in Christianity or Augustinians, friars in Christianity. So what you have is a man uh, who is outside, you know, on his fours looking for something. His friend all of a sudden passes him by and says, Joe, what are you looking for? What's wrong with you? He says, you know, I, I, I'm looking for the keys to the house. Where are they? I don't know. I lost them. And so being a friend, you know, he too gets on the ground and begins to look for the key. After two, three, four, five, six hours of, you know, looking for this key, the friend gets frustrated, looks at this other guy and says, do you remember, can you remember where exactly you lost your key? He says, well, I lost the key inside the house. Well, if you lost the key inside the house, why the hell are you looking for it outside? And he says, well, because there is more light out here. You know, if I ask you who you are, you say, well, I'm a student. I'm a son. I'm a friend. I'm a boyfriend. I'm a girlfriend. I'm a this. I'm a that. And you're always referring to yourself as an identity given to you from the outside. Okay? If, on the other hand, you were to be approached by someone like Socrates, what, who are you? And his question is not so much what is your name, because that was given to you by your parents, or what do you do, because that's something that's been given to you by society. You know, do you go to school? Uh, they don't really much care about the knowledge that's been given to you by academics or by the books you've read. Do you know what your function is in life? It's kind of like the, uh, the poem given to us by Rumi. But once in a while, I wake up and I say, who am I? What am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? Why the hell am I down here? Who made me? What am I supposed to do with my days coming and going? You know, 
it's one thing for me to come to class and give you an assignment and you have a signpost that says assignment will be due in three weeks. You go home, there are the audios, you follow the map and you just kind of get to the destination. If on the other hand, I tell you, so Julian, why don't you go to YouTube and uh, listen to a couple of lectures and just pick something that's interest, interesting to you, then that's a responsibility, it's a burden. What am I supposed to find interesting in these two hour lectures? And how am I supposed to write about the things I am interested in? Why am I interested in those things? It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Because now all the information, all the things that you need to write about need to be generated by you and through you. And it's very, very dark. So what you have in the story is that all of us in this class enjoy looking for keys that are out. You're having a bad day, read the, read the book of Job. It'll tell you why evil is here. It'll tell you what you need to do. It'll tell you what will happen to you. But what becomes very difficult for Job in the book of Job, for those of you in this class who like to read, the book of Job is really, really nice. Not so much because it's a religious text, but it's just beautiful, beautiful literature. You know, Job is interesting because he thinks he knows who God is. He thinks he knows why there is evil. He thinks he knows the answers to life. He thinks he knows everything that needs to be known by a single human being in a single lifetime. He's very cocky. You know, he's very arrogant. And so he basically walks around, like many of us, says, I'm righteous. There is nothing wrong with me. God loves me. I love God. But there is something even more strange to the book because even God, from the very beginning of the book, says, I love Job. He is very faithful. He's my favorite, you know, servant. And there is... Nothing wrong with you reading the Old Testament, going to the church every Saturday or Sunday, praying, knowing what a sin is, knowing what right and wrong are according to the book. Nothing wrong with that. But then something very strange happens to Job, where he is forced to reflect. Not so much think, is today Saturday? Is it the right time to worship or should I wait another hour? That's thinking. Reflection is this way. The only person who can truly educate Job is not God. It's not Job's children. It's not Job's wife. It's Satan. Satan goes to God and says, God, you think that Job is righteous. You think that Job is faithful. I'm here to tell you he's not. And God says, no, Satan, you're wrong. And he says, let me prove it to you. So Satan comes down here. And he says, well, how does one get into the world of reflection? How do you get pushed to really, really reflect, to go inward, to self-examine? You know, there is nothing wrong, and it's, it's an easy task for you to sit there and look at me and say, this guy is really, really boring. Fine. Why don't you come up here? Talk about anything you enjoy to talk about. You want to talk about bicycling? Fine. It does, I don't really care what you want to talk about. Why don't you carry this class for an hour and 15 minutes? How long can you do it for? Now pressure is added. You thought you were really, really good. And remember, you have to be really, really good at something to be able to just ramble on day after day after day after day. You can't just be dim-witted. It doesn't work that way. So what happens is Satan comes down and says, let's try this guy. Let's test his love for his kids. Uh, first, let's try his love for his animals. One by one, the cows, the sheep, the goats, they all get butchered. And, you know, Job says, that's ah, okay. God gives, God takes. God will take care of us, not to worry. His wife and women are very practical, you know, they're very grounded. And we'll talk about the wisdom of women perhaps at a different date. But his wife comes to him and says, how could you worship such a God? But you see, Job doesn't want to examine. He doesn't want to reflect. 
he brushes her off saying, oh, women, be quiet. What the hell do you know about anything? Satan goes up. God is very proud. Job is very proud. And God looks at Satan and says, did you see? Job never blasphemed. He accepted. And Satan looks at God and says, let me go down there once again. Fine. This time Satan comes down and creates an environment where all of his kids are butchered right in front of him. The mother is grieving. And that's what mothers do. They have a connection you know, to their kids from a very, very early stage in their pregnancy and all the way till they come out. The mom is grieving, but Job says, woman, you know, God gives and God taketh away. He still believes that God is in charge of everything. He has the power to make judgments. He has the power to remain untouched by life's disasters. Satan again goes up and God says to him, did you see? Job is a righteous man, I told you. Satan says, not so fast. Let me go down there and touch him. I have touched Job's life, but not Job himself. Are you listening, Job? Shakespeare had this wonderful saying, if you take my watch, I won't be poor. It's just a watch. I can go and buy another watch. If you take my name, I will be poor. And we'll talk about poverty because different, there are different shades of poverty. Some are really good. Some are really, really bad. Now, Satan comes down, Job wakes up, and to make it into perhaps something that all of us can, to some extent, grasp, relate to in some shape or form. Job wakes up, and there is, he just comes to realize he has cancer. This is no longer an animal on the outside. It's no longer a child on the outside. It is you. It is your name. It is your life that will soon disappear. And Joan begins to walk around with a good amount of aches and pains. You know, all of us are saints when it comes to our friends coming to us and saying, I don't want to be with my wife or my husband anymore. I want to dump my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I hate my boss. And we sit there like a saint, like a good therapist and say, well, you got to do A, B, C, D. And then something really strange happens. Life touches you directly. And you realize all the advice that you had given to your friends all of a sudden are no good for you. You keep telling yourself, be positive. This too shall pass. But it doesn't work. And that's the real test. And the moment Job is touched, something really strange happens to him. He begins to reflect. Why is this happening to me? I don't care if he's bored. That's his life. Why do I get bored? Why am I bored? What the hell am I supposed to do in my boredom? Is there something out there that I can find to be a healthy form of distraction? The moment something touches you, your entire world collapses. Your name disappears. You enter into poverty. Now, I don't know if you've ever had anyone in your family who's gotten sick, close to death, and it's something that I borrow from. I don't know if she would consider me a friend, but I consider her to be my friend because she has or had a good amount of wisdom before she passed. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. At a very young age, she started working with people who were sick and dying. And she wanted to understand what happens to people when they are near death. 
what sort of emotions they have, what do they go through, what are their hopes, what are their fears. And so she said that initially when someone comes to realize that they're dying, the first stage they go through is the act of denial. This is not happening to me. Like Job, God loves me. This can't be happening to me. Why am I sick? I pay my taxes. I go to church. I worship. I read the good book. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my neighbors. I love my animals. This should not be happening to me. In fact, it is not happening to me. I'm going to go for a second opinion or a third or a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And all the answers come back the same. You have cancer. You're going to die. There comes a stage where you can no longer deny the fact that you have cancer and cancer is going to just demolish you. Every ounce of your being is going to be demolished, taken by this vicious disease. But you see, you want to find a clue, an answer as to why this is happening to you, but you can't. So you enter the second stage very much like Job. You become profoundly angry. Read the book of Job closely and what do you have? Why is this happening to me? Why didn't my mother's milk turn into poison? Why didn't her knees give? Why doesn't the earth open up and swallow me? I want to die. I don't deserve this. I am faithful. I am righteous. I don't deserve this. No different than all of us in this class. You know, you know, you have a companion who does everything for you or you have a parent who does everything for you, and then you just turn out to be nasty, or they turn out to be nasty to you, and you say, I've done everything to you, for you. I don't really deserve this. And one of the problems with the book of Job is, you may not deserve this, but that's just the way life works. And you know, Job is very stubborn like the rest of us in this class. He doesn't want to think he doesn't want to reflect. And he always wants to push blame onto God. I don't deserve this. And you have to go through very many pages in the book of Job to realize that there comes a point where Job finds himself in the presence of God. God is grand. God is great. And he looks at Job and says, look at you. You worm of a human being. You're pathetic. All you human beings do is complain. You will never understand life. You will never understand how to live life. You will never understand to remove the wrinkles from life. The best you can do is accept. And Job sits and Job begins to reflect that he is indeed a maggot of a human being. That life is far too grand. I mean, look, you're here in Laney. Laney's in Oakland. Oakland's in California. California's in the U.S. U.S. is just a tiny continent that belongs to the world. The world is just one tiny little unit in this grand thing called the cosmos. Our life means nothing. What you do means nothing. How you feel about things mean nothing. Your desire for a grade, none of those things mean anything. So, no one enjoys reflection, very much like Job, because you really, really have to kind of sit back, be very quiet, detach yourself from reacting to life's events, detaching yourself from the emotions that you feel entitled having. And you sit back and say, okay, how am I going to do this? I mean, one of the things about therapy, which wasn't really needed for thousands of years for us, one of the things about therapy is that if you happen to have a good therapist and if you have enough faith and trust in your therapist, eventually, after maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 years of going to the therapist's office, eventually you'll come to a place where you say, I'm just going to be responsible for my reactions. I'm going to be responsible for my emotions. I'm going to be responsible for my expressions. And every time I realize I'm repeating the same old habits, I'm going to look at my companion 
or the person across me and say, I'm sorry, it was my fault. So if that's a little difficult to grasp, let me just do it this way. Life puts inside you buttons. And then life creates environment where those buttons get pushed. And since you're simply a very, very basic animal, hello, 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 it's okay, no problem. And since you're a very, very basic animal, what you do to all these buttons being pushed, you react. I'll give you an example of a button, how two people, maybe with the same history, but different temperament and different process of self-examination react. James Baldwin, you know who he is. James Baldwin and say, uh, Mike Tyson. Imagine at the age of 35, you look at Mike Tyson and you call him the N-word. Now, if you were to simply examine the N-word, it's not just a word. It contains history. And it contains a history that is traumatizing. It has created a good amount of history, good amount of emotions, identity, okay? Now, there is Mike Tyson, and there is James Baldwin. You look at Mike Tyson, and you say to him the N-word. I have no doubt, at the age of 30, 35, he'll get up, he'll walk towards you, and beat the crap out of you. That's Mike Tyson. The N-word pushes a button, and he reacts, he explodes. Counter, James Baldwin. You call him the N-word, he looks at you and says, I wonder what Julian's problem is. He knows my name. Why does he have this deep desire to call me the N-word? What is his problem? What is his sickness? Maybe him and I can engage in a conversation so I can figure out in what ways he is sick, and if I can, maybe I can cure him. <clears throat> Same language, two different reactions. One is filled with reflection, the other simply explodes.